Welcome to Free Media, Free Minds, the show where we talk media and society. I'm Haldi Jansen. And I'm Pume Zamtegazi. In today's show, we talk community radio. South Africa has a history of alternative media, particularly in the print sector, which flourished during the 1980s. After the 1994 elections, however, the state set up ICASA, the Independent Communications Authority of South Africa, for two reasons. One, to give communities greater access to the airwaves, and two, to grant licenses to community radio. Today we ask, what has been the role of the community radio in South Africa since 1994? Is it the alternative and community-driven media it set out to be? And how free can radio be when there is a struggle for resources to survive? To discuss this and more, we're joined in our studio by Mike Rayfield, Director of the Children's Radio Foundation. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks. Nice to be here. Next to him, Franklin Hayes, who is a board member of the World Association of Community Radio and also very active in the community radio sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alvin. And next to him, we have Musin Mabecha, who is an educator and a trainer at the Media Training Center for Health. Welcome, Sis Musin. Thank you so much. And next to her at the end, we have Ru Rushni Ali, who is a station manager for Radio 786 in Cape Town. Welcome. Thank you for having us. If you've just joined us, you're watching Free Media, Free Minds. Before we talk community radio today, let's go to a clip produced by the Children's Radio Foundation. My name is Tukia Kumaroro and I'm living at Bankara Budulong. I'm 21 years of age. I'm in grade 11. I'm coming from a poor family, but now I'm adopted by people at Bankara Budulong. My parents are living at the farm place. Where I live now, they are like my mother and my father. Even though my parents are still alive, they adopted me and they give me that love of parents. The reason why I wanted to get in, involved in CRF and the Radio Kurara is that I wanted to share my life, especially where I come from, it's too difficult and the age that I am. Some people, they would leave the school and they are too old to continue their studies. So now I'm, come, I'm bringing my, myself to, the, to this radio communication media to share uh, those good positive things that youth can take line or climb on it. I learned a lot of things like audio commentary. You will introduce yourself, identify the problem, give the solution to that problem. At this format, they help us to create a radio show because you combine them together, you go there, out there, identify the problem, go to different people, those who have knowledge on that thing, and try to build something that you can bring out to the youth as a complete uh, information. Uh, my vision for this show, I want to take it to a very high level. Uh, I want to see this radio in coming future be one of the best radio, giving identifying problems for the communities and youth that youth, the problem that youth are facing, bring it to the studio, live on air, discussing problems, giving chance to youth to give their own opinion. Don't you think that teenage pregnancy in our country is a problem? Yes, it is a big problem and we can solve it. I think we must go to different schools in our country to tell them about teenage pregnancy and then I want to see my youth in South Africa actually being one of the best youth that South Africa can produce and see the level of teenage pregnancy less in our community as our radio station is a community station. I think it's more powerful when it's youth doing it. When youth like me, if I'm doing those things, I think I'll be an example to other youth. If I'm in a radio, what is wrong with them? They also can do what I'm doing.
That was a clip showcasing Tlotla Romorero from Kurura FM, who is part of the Young Reporters Network, facilitated by the Children's Radio Foundation. Mike, it was indeed a very powerful clip, and it showed the impact that community radio can have in a community. But tell us, what is in fact the state of community radio in South Africa? Uh, I really think the state of community radio is the diversity of everything possible, to be honest. You have stations that perform a very good function within the community, where they are actually the voice of the community, uh, where if auntie so-and-so gets her washing stolen from the line, she can knock on the doors of the station and say, I'd like to go on air, and this is what happened, and where they actually are responding to the needs of people. Um, but you also have radio stations that are very distant from their community, and the community doesn't really know what they're doing nor listen to uh, their broadcasts because they don't have a great relationship with their community. So I think it really runs the spectrum yeah. of everything that's possible. It runs the spectrum of everything that's possible, but Franklin, on what basis do people, uh, are communities and community stations granted licenses to ensure that, not, that their distance is maybe kept, is, is, is you know, covered? Thank you, Alga. I think, look, if you look at the, the legislative framework within South Africa, community radio is licensed as the third tier of broadcasting. So we will have public radio, your SABC stations, you would, you would have the private ones, and then you would have community broadcasting, which would include community radio and TV. Mm -hmm. So it's the third tier of broadcasting and there's clear imperatives in terms of uh, community development. So when a community radio station is licensed, um, there's very clear license mm -hmm. conditions that um, forces this community radio to actually address some of the socioeconomic issues within that community. Um, Roshni, I'd like to, to know, um how is the, is the community radio station supposed to serve the community they're broadcasting to? Um, through the programming, uh, very importantly, because that's the main purpose of, of your radio, through its programming and the interaction, not just from a content perspective, but also at a social level. So you find that radio stations also get involved, in particular at 786 and I think at most of the other radio stations also, is take people from the community. We don't do headhunting. We believe that if you develop also and take people from that community, it's representative, it becomes a voice for that community. Because somebody that works at your station that comes from Bontyville speaks on behalf of the people of Bontyville. And obviously also we um, at Radio 786, for example, don't see what happens within the world separate to what happens within our own situation. So that also becomes representative. Um, it's, it's not a disconnect that the issues that we faced with on the Cape Flats to that that's maybe suffered in other parts of the world. Listen, wait, sorry, sorry, Halka. <laughs> the reason why I'm asking this, the reason why I'm asking this is because to me, right now, like today, um, it seems like the, 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 the churches most mostly have taken over. It's like they're taking over our community radio stations. Is it because of money, of the money, of lack of resources, like in terms of money and what is it? It looks like it's really I, jump. Yeah, I think <laughs> you, if you look at it, it's really an issue of bread and butter politics. It's okay. about survival and churches got a few bucks to spend money. So what they would do is buy up airtime. That's the one side of the coin. The other side of the same coin is that stations are... I wouldn't say lazy, but it's easier to get churches to bring content than yes. for the community radio to go and find community partners to, to, to do why, development Why content. do you think that, that, that this, I mean, because Rishni, you, Rishni, you're saying that there's stories out there, and you're yes. saying that it's difficult to get the content on, why is that? Before you answer, yeah. can I ask Busi, because she comes from the training sector, mm -hmm. are people still interested to get radio training and in that way develop the stories? We've got different uh, perspectives on that as well. Other stations believe they know it all so they don't need training anymore. They would say, we've been around for a long time, mm. and we can do it. Mm. Well, they don't do it, good job out there. So and the other stations, yeah. they're really welcome, and we are making sure that they involve the communities, because community radio is all about community involvement. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mike, I, I think you want to come in here. I, I want to come back to this the issue that, 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 that Franklin was talking about, this, this distance that people are not coming to the stations. Is this, is this your experience? It is to some degree. We work with the Children's Radio Foundation, mm. works with 12 radio stations across the country and in very different environments from Kwamashu and Durban in an urban environment mm. to uh, Naledi FM in Senegal Free State. 
And what I find is interesting is it doesn't matter if you're in an urban area or a rural area, you can, have this, you can still have the same strong relationship to the community if you work at it. Uh, you can organize your programs, you can organize your activities to pull people in and say, look, see us, we are your station. Yeah. Mm. And the stations that don't do that and just sort of close the doors mm. and it all becomes about ego and what they're creating for themselves mm. and their station, those are the ones where the communities stop listening because yeah. they feel like they're arrogant. Yeah, I'd, li I'd like to give a very practical example of yeah. how you can utilize and get the community engaged. It, sometimes it's not just about expecting them to come out to you. We've had an initiative for the last three years called People's Parliament, where we take the radio to that community. And what you actually do is, let's take um, a, a, a recent one where we had gangsterism in, in Lavender Hill. We set up a, com a complete broadcast at the community center. We invited all the role players, from the youth center to the church, to the mosque, to the principal in the, the three principals in the immediate area, anybody that has an influence with the community. And then the community got invited to the community center. So they had an opportunity to ask questions to the role players and vice versa. But now what 786 does for us is because we believe that community radio stations are stakeholders not just by providing entertainment or the fact that you have to cover airtime by, by having programming. We believe that part of our mandate is to change things, right? So what we do is six months later, all the promises made, we have a follow-up. We go back to the people and say, but you made these commitments to this community. Yeah. We want to come back and see if you are fulfilling those so, because it also holds them accountable. Franklin, you've got a bird's eye view because you sit on a national body and, as we've said previously, on, a, on an international body. Is this the experience of many radio stations or is the bread and butter politics becoming more and more the challenge? Because the 786 example sounds like, like heaven. It sounds yeah. like the perfect model. But is this happening in reality? There's a quote that says everything rises and falls on leadership. So the challenge is really for the radio stations to take that ownership, um, to really make sure that they reach out to their communities. Look, the purpose for any community radio station is to get local players, role players, stakeholders within the, that community that deals with specific socioeconomic issues to come on board and partner them. Because you see, the thing with the radio station, I always make this uh, an analogy, um, is that you will have a community radio almost like uh, a house pipe. Um, and then your organizations and partners and s it, the community itself would be the reservoir of content. So that content need to go through that pipeline so that it can reach the, the specific destination. So it's very important for community radio um, boards, the, 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 the directors and the management of community radio to start asking these questions. And I think in the context of national, um, uh, the national agenda in South Africa, if you look at the National Development Plan, there's an opportunity for us to really, you know, reposition ourselves yeah. um, as a community radio yeah. sector. Yeah. But then, but then, sorry, Franklin, it seems like we're grilling you here. Um, no, 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 it's just that I'd like to know how are they sustaining themselves now? Because how? I think, how? Rush, I think Rushni can tell us. <laughs> okay, I think Rushni can tell us. <laughs> I think, you know, in all fairness, I think every radio station is trying to do its best, despite some of the egos or the lack of resources. Ultimately, there was a reason why you were created. Some has sidetracked majorly, and others um, are still trying to, to, to look at that objective. It's, it's really difficult because government does not come into the party. I mean, in the Western Cape alone, the provincial government really handpicks who they want to be associated with because that's the message that's getting pushed. Push Pushed out. Yes, Rashna, I, I want to ask this question <laughs> based on that because in a previous show, we, our, our producers, when we were researching the show, there was an, a study done by the FXI which said that more and more community stations are losing their independence. They're being influenced by outside, externally, yes. but also about because of the um, the competition for resources. Is this? Are they losing the the independence? Or is the political pressure on them? There's a few examples of this, um, Helga. Is there's a station in the Free State that was overrun by uh, supporters of a specific political party, and you know the guys locked themselves up in the studio, 
and they actually hijacked the studio um, during a time, a very sensitive time, because uh, it was a run-up to uh, elections. Isn't this dangerous? Isn't this? It is dangerous, and there's legislation for this. And if ICASA monitors stations, and I think that's the other question I didn't get to the answer when you asked me earlier about the sustainability of the sector, you would find that we've we've now have we now have a a a, a, a new legislative framework with the Electronic Communications Franklin, Act. Franklin, let's take a short break. You're watching Free Media Free Minds, and we'll be right back. joined us, you're watching Free Media, Free Minds. We're talking community radio. During the break, we spoke about the bread and butter politics, Franklin, and this was the point that you raised before we went. But Busi, you've got a point to make about this. It's been burning. Yes. As an NGO, we are the Media and Training Center for Health Training Community Radio Stations on how to make sure that they involve communities in whatever that they're producing, in content development and everything. And as part of that, we also do follow up for support to make sure that they produce the programs that speak to the community. And we pay them for a time to, to, to produce programs and then broadcast the programs. Mm. But we were surprised when one radio station said they cannot uh, accept our offer to train them on that because they don't have people that are committed. People want to come and go. They don't want to go to the community out there. You understand? So it's also, it, it talks about two things. Even though they're complaining that they don't have money, yeah. But they are not prepared to do enough that can end them a little bit. Mike, why do you think that people are not, has, has, has radio lost its sexiness? I, I don't think so. I mean, I think <laughs> what's interesting with that, Busi, is that actually maybe NGOs need to think about how they can build capacity at community radio stations. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we often talk about the impoverished uh, community of skills at radio stations sometimes, but how can we, in interfacing with them in projects, actually help them to build themselves? Mm -hmm. And I think that can bring the sexy back to radio. <laughs> <laughs> but also, Alga, if, if you look at that, um, and like I said earlier again about the reservoir um, uh, example, yeah. is that you, know, you live within a community, and I always say it becomes like an ecosystem, a development ecosystem. It's like a garden, you know? So you've got all these different plants, but at the end you want to create this beauty, and you want the community radio to understand that they need these organizations as partners. I think in the end, sometimes the kind of the example, the example this, that uh, Vusi just raised here was where the station acknowledged that they don't have resources, they don't have the people that they can make com uh, accountable and yeah. commit to the project and that's why they said that they are not willing to participate, which is said in, in, you know, on the one end because Ultimately, the station need to address the kind of challenges, the socio-economic challenges that MTC is trying to address. So, uh, um, um, very good example by Mike. The, the challenge is again, and, and it goes back to the leadership of the structures within the community radio sector. You know, within the station itself, within the provincial structure, within the national structure, global structure, what we need to look at is the social impact of our community radio. Rishni, you made a point, thank you Franklin for that one, but I want to just come back to a point that you made during the break about community radio stations needing to be, it sounded like, a link between all, and not trying to take over the work of yes. the NGOs. Yes. Talk, talk to us about yes. that. It's about partnerships. Yeah. Because as much as, as important as the financial resources, human resources, and the content is, but through those partnerships, you actually build all of that. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, uh, for example, why must a radio station, when it's a broadcaster, want to start a feeding scheme when you have three or four feeding schemes in it and to work with them because then also you filter the message greater over a greater uh, part of the area. 
again it comes back then you get also your community involved in the radio station on the other issue of skills for example and empowering people for us it's very big like we take 14 year olds uh, our news editor just won the Vodacom journalist um, of the year for for the radio feature award he's an He's a 20-year-old that has been with 786 for the last seven years. He is from Wantyville. He left school, came to work at the station, and the, and the station paid for his education. But he's going to leave and he's going to end up at an ETV. But you know what? He takes that passion and that skills for his community. He takes with. So at ETV, hopefully, he won't just uh, be representing yeah. commercial and profit interests. I think that's a very important point, but Mike, I want to come to you because you work with young people. Do you think that there's a, is there competition between other technologies for communication and radio? Because radio has always been a very big sector, particularly on the continent, as a means of communication. So young people, oh, young people moving more towards other forms of communication? Yeah, I, mean, I think young people are all over the place in terms of what they're using from watching television, listening to radio, on Facebook, on their phones, on Twitter. But a lot of these media do not succeed in letting young people showcase their experiences and speak about their lives and listen through the radio and hear that some other young person is having this experience mm. that they are having too and they've never heard someone talk about before. And if you can show me another media that's capable of doing that, I'm there. But until then, radio is it for me. Yeah. Well, um, since we'll see you, you educate and train, mm. um, and as part of the training that we do, yes. we also make sure that we, we encourage stations to use okay. other forms of media, to use social media mm. in their programming, yeah. to, to attract whoever is out there. Yeah. Yeah. But are the youth still interested in training to be on radio? Can the youth, the youth you train. Yes, yes. Are they still interested? In being on radio? Yeah. Yes. Some of them, they, they just think of themselves as celebrities because <laughs> they are on air. <laughs> Mike, I want to ask you now, because now we've spoken about the state of radio in our, in our, in our country, but what is the state of radio on the continent and globally? I, if I can just recount, I'm not sure if some of our viewers who are maybe a little bit closer to my age, remember uh, SABC ad a couple of years ago where they had a TV and a radio in the TV, because this was one of the most powerful means of communication. What is it on the rest of the continent? Look, there's a, there's, a, there's a statistic saying that there's more radios in Africa than people having access to running water. So there, there's more radios in people, you know, people having access to radio than, um, and also there's another statistic saying that there's more um, radios than, than, than people owning their own mattresses. So, so, so that's the reality in terms of the context. And if you look at the divide between urban and rural in Africa, you would find that radio is still the biggest medium to reach rural areas. If you look at um, East Africa, if you look at West and Central Africa, you would find that radio is growing. The big challenge, however, in Africa is the legislative part. It's where you look at community radio, for instance, mm. in, in um, um, uh, Kenya, you would find that they've got three types of two types of community radio. The one is called vernacular, which is really private-owned small stations. Yeah. Um, and that's where actually the, the problem started in the previous elections, because a vernacular station pushed the agenda or the propaganda for a specific political party, and the community radio was, yeah. was blamed. Yeah. So I think the growth is, 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 is healthy, but however, it's not necessarily that it's in the right direction always. That's, that's, that's the point we want to come to before we... Is, is what is the... The potential still. We've had 20 years in this country in way of, of, of democratic access to the airwaves. So is community radio moving in the direction of truly providing an alternative means of, of accessing, or not a means, an alternative space to access information? In their programming, are they changing the way people think? If you can just give me three sentences. Look, in South Africa, let's take South Africa as an example. You would find that in the beginning, civil society, social, you know, civil society organizations actually lobbied for community radio. Yeah. There was a lobby pre-94 where civil society came together and said, Me, we need to get involved in this discussion to open up the airways. And that's where Open Network and all of those organizations came together and put together an, an agenda. So they developed a discussion document on a three-tier broadcasting system. In South Africa at the moment you would find that the market dictates. Mm. So what happened is that this uh, second economy activity which is community radio now 
needs money. Yes. You, you raised the question earlier. And so, and so the economic yes. uh, need for the radio yeah. station dictates. It's very difficult, and I know people will, 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 will criticize me for making this statement, but it's true. I'm also at the radio station. I'm at Radio Casey, and where we are in that Paul, beautiful Paul Valley, yeah. we are struggling to stay alive. So it is the bread and butter issue coming back. But I would say that you ask whether we are still relevant. I think it's very difficult if the leadership of the radio station doesn't take, you know, yeah. that seriously. On that point, I want to ask each of you for a, a final thought on the relevance, especially on mm. the relevance of, of, of community radio and what the successes have been, starting with Rishi. Okay, I think there's very much relevance and still a need for community radio because no one tells our story other better than us. Mm. So very much so. I think also where we're going with the secrecy bill and all of the other issues that we find ourselves with within media, even more so because community radio stations don't have the same capitalist interests. So it's important for us to stay true to this message and that is to serve the people. Yeah. Busi, mm. any concluding thoughts? Yeah, I think it's still relevant, but community radio stations need to open up to... Uh, to getting more information so that they can be informed and know how to deal with the communities yes. so that they can cover issues that are uh, 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 the communities uh, that are affecting the communities for instance we're working with the community with the commonwealth of learning in one project that we introduced to stations we call it the community learning program mm -hmm. where we make sure that stations partner with st local stakeholders and also we involve with it's, it's like a three-legged pot there's stakeholders on one end there's the community radio station in another side and then the community community in the other side, where the community come up with issues that are affecting them so that the producers at the station mm. work together with the, with the, with the stakeholders yeah. to develop the content. But stations, because, because of the bread and butter that we've talked about, they don't have uh, yeah. the capacity. And some of them will say, we work with, with, with volunteers, we cannot force them to do what they're supposed to do. Thank you. Mike, any concluding thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, a lot of community radio stations are really well poised to be these centers of youth opportunity within communities. And I think that if they think of their mission slightly differently rather than we are broadcasting content, but we're going to be a resource center where you as a young person can come in and get trained like at 786, they're doing a tremendous service. And lastly, I think that we as organizations that are sort of overarching and working with a lot of community stations need to acknowledge that the community radio is not sustainable as it is positioned now and to come up with new solutions to fund some of the amazing work that's happening at stations. Franklin, do you have anything else to add? I think just to conclude, um, I'm from Amok, and I think, you know, we are growing. We've got about 5,000 community radio stations globally, um, and our most productive and active uh, stations is in Latin America and, and in the new developing India and uh, Pacific region. Um, so I think that if you look at the health of community radio, I think it is healthy. I think it's very important for us to not lose the faith. We are not prophets of doom. We are saying that we need to just check ourselves from yeah. time to time. Yeah. So I think there is definitely an opportunity. Thank you very much to our guests. I think we've had an exciting show. Lots of interesting ideas coming out. Remember, community radio requires that you and I, the community, become part and parcel of that media. Thank you to all our guests. Join us next time. I'm Helga Janssen. And I am Pumezam Tegazi. Till we meet again on Free Media, Free, Free Minds. Minds. I am ready. We are here. Open, come